Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers, presented by FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. Ant, it's springtime. There's baseball again. The weather has turned nice. It's a sea change everywhere I look. Please remember that when I ask, <laughs> what's new and exciting in your world this weekend? Well, this week's interesting news comes from Krakow, Poland, where a woman alerted Krakow Animal Protection that she had spotted a strange creature crouching in a local tree for the previous two days. She wasn't the only person who saw it. Animal Control received several calls from other people about this same creature. Panic spread throughout the neighborhood, not knowing what the creature was nor how dangerous it might be. Parents were keeping their children inside. People kept their doors and even their windows closed, lest the thing make its way into their homes during the night or something. To animal control, the woman said, quote, He's been sitting here for two days and everyone is scared of him. The local authorities initially thought it was a late April Fool's joke, but callers were insistent that it was not a hoax. People knew it wasn't a bird. Some thought it might be an iguana, possibly in distress. An iguana in Poland. I don't know. I don't know how these things work. But Animal Control finally sent someone around who found the creature quietly nestled in a lilac bush. It was neither bird nor iguana. The creature that had paralyzed the Krakow neighborhood for two days was a croissant. (laughs) Uh, A a what? (laughs) You know, the flaky bread thing you get for $2.50 from Starbucks. They were afraid of a baked good? (laughs) It was a croissant. (laughs) I mean, how big can this? I've never seen a croissant any bigger than a small child's hand. (laughs) Well, apparently they're dangerous looking. I don't know. Was this a three foot long croissant that they only have in Poland? No, I think it was your standard issue Starbucks type croissant. Apart from their minute contribution to obesity, there is no known incident of a croissant directly harming anyone. There's a good lesson here. We live in a world where more so than at any other point in human history, things, be they diseases, accidents, natural disasters, or even other humans, are unlikely to harm you. So the next time you encounter something scary in gossip, on the news, on social media, or even in a nearby lilac bush... Take a deep breath and remember FDR's words that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I want to get back to this croissant business because it more or less calls to mind something that I've been, I don't know, pretty cheesed about for a while. Because as you know, Ann, I moved into a new home, what, a couple of years back now. And uh, part of that new home was joining the ever popular HOA. And there's uh, an online next door for my neighborhood and this kind of nonsense. And what I've been noticing is that people use these things in order to avoid talking to one another. Every week, like clockwork, somebody will post, it's really noisy two doors down. And I'm thinking, well, get your lazy ass out there, go two doors down, knock on the door and tell them to turn it down. Right. And so too with the croissant. If scores of people were calling in 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 fear over this thing in the tree, Couldn't one of them get up the nerve to walk out to the tree and take a look? (laughs) It might jump on you, James. For crying out loud, how hard is it to just say, well, that doesn't look normal. I think I will stroll about and see what's going on there. But (laughs) but no, no. I don't know what the hell's wrong with everybody, but somehow it's all wrapped up into this thing that you talked about today. So I'm going to take us in a decidedly different direction and, and tell you that the headline is making the rounds now that some mass vaccination sites in the U.S. will close as demand begins to fall. Yeah, how about that? Isn't that that interesting? And it seemed to me when I read this, and this is from a New York Times story, we'll put the link in the show notes for you. When I read this this morning, I thought, you know, that can't be right. To my knowledge, I don't think we have sufficient vaccinations that demand would be falling at this point. So I ambled over to our world in data, which is a thing that you and I often use, a matter of fact, my daughter, who now writes these sorts of things that we write, told me to go take a look there, and I did. And it looks like we have about 41% of the American public has been vaccinated. Hmm. So should we be seeing a drop in demand? Well, probably not if we wanted to see something like 80% coverage. Right. 
And yet what these two things together tell me is that we're not going to get an overwhelming majority of Americans to vaccinate. That's not going to happen. My open question is, well, what does that mean in terms of herd immunity? What percentage do we need in the public at large to achieve herd immunity? I don't know what that answer is. I know it's a fair bit higher than 41%. And yet what you're getting here is perfectly predictable from economic principles because the vaccine exhibits a positive externality. That is, the more people out there that have it, the less likely I am to get the disease because of approaching herd immunity. And so the less likely I am to get the disease, the less incentive I have to get the inoculation. So it doesn't surprise me at all that it's slowing down as more and more people get inoculated. Nor I, and I would continue along that line of reasoning at least to a degree and point out that we've got a number of people in the United States who don't really want to be vaccinated for much of anything. In the first place, right, yeah. And as you and I well know, and I'll state outright that I think that perspective is silly in the large. However, I also think it has to be allowed in a free society. And that friction between freedom and helping your neighbors is always a friction. So I don't expect we're going to solve much here, but we can point to it and say, okay, here's a prime example of what happens when you take freedom seriously. A lot of time, if not all of the time, people choose things with their freedom that you would never choose for yourself. And that has to be okay. I disagree here where the vaccine is concerned because it looks, and I've said this before, it looks exactly like pollution. It does. However, I can guarantee that I'm not exposed to it. I take the vaccine. There's no chance that I'm going to get this. Yeah, but that's not correct because no vaccine is 100% effective. Right, but it's so negligible that I think you got to let it slide. Look, there are some things that I would say, no, you must take the vaccine. That has to be a matter of good sense and probably law. And I think of things like polio. Mm -hmm. But this isn't that if we have an effective vaccine out there that protects everyone who takes it. Look, I just think it's worth thinking through. We're not going to arrive at, yeah. at a conclusion here today, but sooner or later, you and I are going to have to think this one through more deeply. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's coming down to an empirical question of what are the numbers here? But again, I want to clarify what I said earlier when I said it's like pollution. Not that the vaccine is like pollution, but the disease is like pollution. So if somebody has it and they can spread it to others in terms of economics, that is no different than my dumping pollution into the air or trash into your yard or whatever it is. And we have no problem with government intervening in those instances. We should have similarly no problem with government intervening here. Right. But if there were a low cost glass dome that you could put on your property to prevent, right, against which all things simply bounced off, right then I don't think you would really need or want to have any laws whatsoever. It's just worth thinking through. This is the sort of thing that divides a lot of the people who listen to the podcast. Half are breaking one way, half the other. They each have their own reasons, some great, some silly. But this is where we are right now, and I think it's interesting and it's going to be instructive for all kinds of other things later. I suspect we're going to end up doing an entire episode on this before long. I think so, too. And it's one more of these things that with all of this COVID nonsense, we've got to wait for the data to come in because yeah. nobody really knows much about it to be able to say anything definitive in one direction or the other. Right. Which is why we always tell you, anybody who's got the big answer right now, full of it. Yeah. Absolutely full of it. We're still going to need, my guess is what, another year, year and a half's worth of data. I would say so. And that's just to understand what happened over the past year. Yep, that's right. Not to do any fancy walking because the sidewalk isn't made for fancy walking. You won't know the reference there whatsoever. But three of our listeners are laughing hysterically right now. Sidewalks for regular walking. But Ant, this of course brings us to the foolishness of the week. And it's not a person exactly this time, but I want to think about the United States Postal Service. A fantastic operation, cost effective. No, the, the Postal Service can't do a thing right. We all know this. It's almost impossible to say a good thing about how the post office is run. But Ant, I'm sensing there's a little bit of mission creep over at the post office because having figured out how to deliver the mail so perfectly and without incident, they now reportedly track all of our social media posts. What in God's green earth is anybody thinking putting the Postal Service in charge of snooping in on people's social media? 
Or maybe it's a good idea. If you don't want people to be surveyed, put the post office in charge of surveying. Well, I guess that's right. If they bring that same aplomb to this job that they bring to all of their (laughs) other ones, the American people will be unmolested for decades to come. But I can't really understand what the hell is up with this. This is That is serious mission creep. It really is. I mean, what on earth are you thinking? And first and foremost, what on earth is any part of the federal government doing monitoring social media in the first place? For crying out loud. Every time I turn around, the government is doing something more stupid than they did the day before. And sooner or later, you think math would break that string. But no, it does not. So this is the brave new world we're living in now. Be sure to say hello to your carrier next time he passes (laughs) by your house. If you haven't already, pick up a copy of our book, Cooperation and Coercion, How Busybodies Became Busy Bullies and What That Means for Economics and Politics. You can find Cooperation and Coercion at Amazon. And if you've already read our book, please leave us a glowing review at the aforementioned Amazon. And a special thanks to James Bradley, somebody over on Words and Numbers backstage, where the conversation continues, for pointing out the foolishness of the week this week. This week, John Lefebvre joins us. John is a Canadian musician, composer, entrepreneur, retired lawyer, and philanthropist. He's currently active as an author and activist on climate change issues. In 2017, he published his first book, All's Well, Where Thou Art Earth and Why a work of political, moral, and legal philosophy. As a dot-com-era entrepreneur, John ran afoul of the government by competing with it in areas in which it doesn't like competitors. He paid $100 million in fines and yet emerged still a multimillionaire. He has spent the years since then giving most of that money away to worthy causes. John, thanks for coming. Nice of you to be here. Not the usual kind of guest we get. I'm not saying that the other ones aren't interesting, But you're kind of interesting, and I was thinking maybe it would be for the best if you told our listeners about your life, you know, from 35,000 feet. Just give us a broad autobiographical overview. I was 17 in 1969 when the first time I was arrested for selling acid to cops that were dressed up like hippies. (laughs) That was a good experience, tuned me up for the later part of my life. I was raised in the Catholic school system in Calgary's oil city in Western Canada. It's a beautiful city situated not far from the mountains. We could show up at the high school parking lot and be on the ski hill by nine (laughs) o'clock. And, you know, or mountain biking and cross-country skiing and stuff. It's beautiful. You go to Calgary at lunchtime, it's 35 below outside, and like 10,000 people are out jogging because they want to be in shape to go cross-country skiing or whatever they're doing in there. It's a wonderful city that way. Lots of clear heads. (laughs) Lots of really, really clear heads. I grew up there. My mom was a single mom. My dad died when I was a little guy. I was arrested for being a hippie political prisoner when I was 17, did a year when I was 18. Then I eventually wound my way up into university, became a lawyer, practiced law for about 14 years. And I met a guy, Steve Lawrence, who was an outsider. He was a maverick. He developed the idea of bringing an online money transfer system to the online gaming industry. He thought that would be a good little business model if you could bring a little responsibility and reliability and professionalism to that. And so we did that. I came up with the name Net Teller. We started the business with Friends Money. About three years later, we went public on the London Stock Exchange on the AIM board, achieved a market cap of around $2 billion. I think I owned 27% of that at one point. And then not too many years after that, Uncle Sam put up his hand. <laughs> it all kind of evaporated. Well, not all of it, but... I'm on the beach now. I've been on the beach since then, but I'm merely wealthy now. I'm not like super wealthy. (laughs) Merely wealthy. That's not something we hear often. I got to tell you. The place that takes me to, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here this morning, I think, is that having been a wealthy guy, those guys don't fool me anymore. (laughs) And I've done some thinking, started with thinking about the responsibilities of freedom that drifted into the responsibilities of wealth. And they're very similar things. And those those ideas form the basis of a book I wrote called All's Well, Where Thou Art Earth and Why. It's about where we are in infinity and in eternity, how young we are and how far the road is ahead of us. And I audaciously, I suppose, plot the principles upon which we should carry forward to be successful as a species in the universe. The epilogue of my book is a rewriting of the Declaration of Independence, but universal. Maybe we'll have you back for another whole episode for that, because that's right in my wheelhouse. But the way you're talking now, you've brought us from a micro perspective, a man who having achieved 
vast wealth. And then the macro perspective, how you think that should be applied to the larger problems of human society. So back us up a little bit, John, if you would. What's it like to have more money than you could ever hope to use in 10 lifetimes? It's like a dream, man. You know, it's like when you're a kid, you, you wake up in the night and you had a bag of gold and you put it under your pillow and it's not there in the morning. <laughs> yeah, well, it was there in the morning for me. I was that kid who, you know, every time stuck his hand in his pocket, it was full. I'm the guy li least likely, you know, I couldn't even bother to balance my checkbook when I was a kid. I was fortunate in a way, James, because I was 50 or so before this even started. When we started, I was about 50 and I was 55 before, you know, we hit the home run. I spent a good bit of my life thinking a lot already about fairness and people who are advantage takers, what they might do to exonerate themselves. It went to my head, but never quite so completely as it does to some nouveau guys. I would drive by Santa Monica BMW and see a car in the window for $140,000 and I wrote them a check for it and they took it across the street and it cleared and I drove the car out, <laughs> you know. I bought a $5 million house on Malibu Beach without checking my balance. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. But then I bought another one. <laughs> John, I got to tell you, I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. I'm also kind of angry. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'll share with you all I can, James. <laughs> Thanks, man. But that's an interesting <laughs> thing, because I think half of the world will hear that story and say, that's horrible. Nobody should have that. Oh, no. And the other half would hear it and say, no, everybody should have everybody that. Everybody should have that. That's right. I'm not angry because I think nobody should have that. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> it's interesting, though. You seem to have a perspective on this, that when we think about the fantastically rich, the quick and new rich, right? We're talking Bitcoin millionaires and billionaires, and they tend to be very, very young so much so that they really can't figure out how to get out of their mother's basement, even though they're millionaires. You, on the other hand, you point to something that I think is incredibly interesting. You say that you were 55, 57 before this hit, and you're equipped to deal with it in a different sort of way. Ant and I are both in our early 50s. Well, Ant's probably in his late 50s by now. <laughs> and when we think about things now, we think about things the way middle-aged or older men do, and it's radically different than it once was. When I was a kid, we would know philosophers and stuff like that. It was a different world. People read books and stuff. And then I decided to write a book into the worst audience that was ever born for book reading, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, your mortgage payment wasn't contingent upon book sales, so you really don't have to worry about it that much. No, I've given away more books than anybody I've ever run into. I'd like to sit way up high here because you've lived the kind of life that most people can't even dream of. What advice do you have for what we would all call, I think, normal people, people who are never going to have billions of dollars? The most precious thing that has ever fallen into my lap has fallen into mine no more than it has into everybody else's. And that is the ability to sit here and be mm. here, be here now. It's a treasure. Think of what the universe would be like if it weren't to be beings like us. Imagine what a fascinating place the universe would be, but there would be nobody to be fascinated by it. We are the universe's vessels of astonishment. And we are all that, even the starving lady in the desert in Sudan, the starving baby flea bitten, dying at her dusty breast. We all have the same capacity to dream and we all have the same capacity for disappointment. I think that we would feel a lot better about ourselves if we gave that woman a break and all the rest of them as well. Ant and I talk about these sorts of things more often than you might think. He's an econometrician. I'm a political philosopher. Really, what we're looking for is a way through the thicket that we could achieve human flourishing. And that's human flourishing. It's not American flourishing. It's quite universal. And if you look at the data year over year, we're actually getting there. We're getting there very slowly. I'll grant you, but it's better now. And the people who listen to this podcast are going to roll their eyes because of how many times I've said this. But when asked if I could choose any period to live, when would I choose? I always choose right this second or any time in the future. What I've achieved relative to what my grandparents were able to achieve is monumental. 1969 was a trip, but and as beautiful as it was, I would trade it for 2069 for sure. Yeah. I was born in 67. And my children, they like to talk to me about what it was like in the 70s. And I always have to say, well, you know, wasn't that great? <laughs> when you kind of think about it, that you guys have all the best of it. 
it's a little depressing because I'll be dead by the time their children are their age. And I would have loved to have seen what got accomplished past my lifetime. John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith are still part of the conversation, James, and you can do that too. Thank God. I'm actually very, very optimistic, and it seems that you are too. I can actually see you, and I could tell the people listening right now that John's been smiling since we started. <laughs> I think the future for us, it's generous, and the dividends of generosity are gratitude. It's a gift that goes on. It outlives the giver. I think that's one of the reasons Ant and I like to point out that people are doing better now than they ever have. Yeah. Because when you're caught in your life in the moment, you don't typically think, I should be thankful for this. It's just something that gets shuffled to the back of your brain. But boy, we are lucky. I really want to ask you guys some things about economics because you know more about those things than I do. But I've been stumped toying with this theory about wealth is infinite. We all think that our economy needs you know, growth to be healthy. And it seems to me like about 20% of the people on the planet right now are well prepared to pull on the oars and 80% are not. And if we developed those people, gave them education and the tools of self-improvement and the sorts of things, made it available to them, which is easier to give every day now with internet and stuff, then if we increase their productivity, then there would be an increase of wealth and the wealth would snowball, would it not? I mean, is there a limit to how much wealth there is or is it infinite? It's infinite because human capacity is infinite. People say about how we're running out of resources. I say, well, hang on a second. A particular resource, be it oil or whatever, may be limited, but resources aren't. And you could look back in history, and once upon a time, we heated with wood until we discovered whale oil. And then we heated with that until we discovered petroleum. Then we heated with that until we discovered uranium. And we heated with, And what happens is humans created resources out of things that weren't resources before. The perfect example of limitless wealth is to look at our standard of living, yours, mine, James, versus our great-grandparents. And quite literally, what today we call poverty in the United States was upper middle class living a century and a half ago. We're living infinitely better than the medieval kings of Sweden. We are. It goes to your point about being thankful for what we have. And I think so many people have this view that the world is going to hell largely because they take for granted all the wonderful things we have. We take these things for granted and we should take them for granted. The thing that we shouldn't take for granted is that I can't help but if I'm lucky is a good enough reason to just let it stay where it is, right? For me, the cost of freedom is, you know, when we were kids, they used to tell us that the cost of freedom is the highest price you ever have to pay. You have to pay with your life. You know, you're frightened was. I think it's higher than that. I think the cost of freedom is higher than that. First of all, if that's the cost of freedom, only one guy in 100,000 ever pays it and everybody else gets right. their freedom for free. But I think the real cost of freedom is that every day that freedom that we live, we have a duty, we have an obligation to strive to do whatever we can to assure that those who are less fortunate in the freedom department will come to enjoy it as well. I think it's further than that too, because I think when you look at Ant and me, we are living middle-class American lives, pretty standard issue. And that's better than probably 99% of the human beings who have ever walked the earth. Absolutely. And I think we owe a debt to people who came before. I mean, even if it's only the kind of debt that you understand in your mind and don't talk about all that much. But I think we owe a debt, and I think we only can pay that debt by living well. We have to be worthy of the freedom that we've got and the things that come with it. And that's, I think, where most of us kind of fail. We don't do that as much as we should. We used to have a really elevated impression of human nature. Adam Smith thought that quaintly he called us men. I think he meant people. But he thought men were good. And if you give yeah. good men money and freedom, they'll do what's best for everybody. Yeah. They know what to do. They'll live better. Now we think if you give a guy 400 bucks for COVID, you're going to turn him into a bum. And he's going to be a bum for the rest of his life. It's very, very depressing to me that that is a prevailing view of human nature in America. It's not the view that gave birth to America. And it's not even the view that existed. I want to go back to your story of being 17 in the hippie movement. It's not even the view that was then. I look back on that. I was too young then, but I look back on it and I think if I had been a teenager or young adult during that period, I probably would have joined them. The idea of love and peace and let people be, what happened to that? 
because that message sounds much more like what you hear from libertarians today than what you hear from the left today. It's one thing to say those things. It's another thing to live them out. You know what Joni Mitchell said about that, eh? When we were kids, we decided we were going to change the world. And then we figured out we couldn't do that. We decided to change ourselves. And then we decided we couldn't do that. When we realized we couldn't do that, we decided to get rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think that's where it all went. But you know what? America is exactly the same. This is very apt because the founding principles of America are insurmountable, absolutely the pinnacle of principles for human development. All men are created equal. It's the most important sentence ever written. And the rest of that sentence. That's right. What we're entitled to, right? I'm optimistic that we are going to be able to fulfill the promise of that sentence. And it won't be but a couple more generations that it's going to happen in. I was just going to say the hippies bit off a lot more than they could chew when they turn everything into peace and love. And America yeah. bit off a lot more, obviously, than they could chew when they said all men are created equal. Sure, we're still working on it. And that's fine. It's fine that we're still working on it. I would feel bad if we weren't still working on it. I remember I was in graduate school and I went to a place that understood the American founding to be probably the high point in human existence. Whether that's true or not, I offer no answer, but that was the perspective at the program. And a friend of ours was in school with me, Tom Cranawitter, and he started arguing with somebody who was just taking shots at the American founding. And he kept going back to what equality actually meant and what it yielded. And the guy at the end of the argument just kind of threw his arms up and said, well, I guess you win and stormed out. And my friend Tommy, who's a hick from Kansas, looked up and said, that's powerful shit. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of the greatest utterances I ever heard in an academic setting. <laughs> it's fantastic. I won't go on long here, but it reminds me of something. Like a buddy of mine, David Paris, sent me this thing. It's a trailer for a new movie that Kelsey Grammer's in. Have you heard about it? In Between? No. no. It'll knock you out, man. He plays this old hippie. He's all like Hawaiian shirts and big beard and stuff like that, but just keeps saying this stuff like, wow, man. Like, really. <laughs> There's something to be learned from those guys, but yeah. execution wasn't one of them. <laughs> Actually, I think they did as well as they could have given the situation at the time, which is, I think, all we can legitimately ask of anyone. The main thing is about raising consciousness. It was a pretty good stab at that. Yeah. That's the gift that goes on giving. I mean, that's how we grow the world is by taking really smart things and sharing them with other people and watching other people grow from the things that we share with them, right? And with the declaration, people as different as Ho Chi Minh on the one hand and American feminists on the other have used the logic of the declaration explicitly. They've pointed right at it. They've rewritten it like you have because it lends itself to that sort of thing. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece. You're just way too interesting. I'm going to have to have you on for another five or six episodes. I'm really in interested in hearing about your rewrite of the declaration. But I think James is right. That's going to take a whole episode. <laughs> I'll send you guys PDFs. I can tell that our listeners are going to be very interested in hearing you talk and not us talk. So tell us more about giving money away, because apparently you gave away almost as much as you made. I gave away about half of what I pulled off the table, 70 million or so. Oh, wow. oh my God, man. Come on. And what does that feel like to do that? It felt pretty natural to me. You know, yeah. it felt like when I was a kid, I lived in a house where some people sold acid and they put the money in a bucket in the cupboard. And if you needed a piece of pie, you went into the bucket. And <laughs> that was the way it went. I swear, I've said this before. I've never done anything that was succeeded in my life when I was surrounded by some really, really great conservatives. They just railed at me the whole time. John, you're hemorrhaging this money. You know, what the hell are you doing? Right. And I just kept saying, well, you know what? I don't care if it runs out, you know, I'll never have any trouble getting a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> but you know what it is even if it's a bit radical you want to live what you think demonstrate what you think that's what i did it wasn't all smart giving about half of it was <laughs> <laughs> that's a better track record than the government does <laughs> that is correct that is much better okay i'm glad you brought that up Anthony, because i want to talk about that people say okay you got all these dreams of principles for the future what's the most important thing i think the most important thing we got to do is stop dissing government to kids when there's kids around. The thing that we've invented with constitutional democracy is the most powerful instruments ever been created by the human species for the control of the selfish wealthy, call them kings, whatever you want. To diss government now, to discourage the young people from reaching out for those levers of power 
It's just exactly the wrong time in history to do that. We should be encouraging them to pay taxes, encouraging them to participate in government and go ahead and dis individuals, but not the institutions. The institutions are sacred and we have to really encourage kids to take it over. The two powers that constitutional democracy that the selfish wealthy fear the most are the powers to regulate and the powers to tax. And that's another thing that I've stumbled upon is conservatism used to be about conservation and development of capital. All these people are the same now. David Brooks at the New York Times, I hear this morning it was so, what's her name? That's on the carpet for voting against Trump in Texas. What's her name? Dick Cheney's daughter, Liz Cheney. Mm, Lynn Cheney. Yeah, she said regular conservatism, small government, low taxes. But small government, low taxes, you guys, those are dog whistles for no regulation and I don't want to share. I'm old enough to remember the principled approach when that meant limited government and wide berth for personal freedom. It's kind of sad how I look at both the American left and the American right, and I don't see a whole lot of principle on either side. I just see the will to win. One of you guys said this, that the proper province of government is to protect people from harming others. Prevent people from harming others, right. How do libertarians protect the atmosphere? Well, that's the same. If a company is polluting, that's harming others. Right. It falls well within the purview of government. I think libertarians do very well when they're discussing things like consenting adults in whatever situation you want to talk about. They don't do nearly as well when we start thinking about tragedies of the commons. They don't do nearly as well when we start thinking about the rights of children, these sorts of things. I'm not going to say that it's a blind spot, but it's almost a blind spot. <laughs> Good. Yeah, 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 right. And this is one of the reasons why Ant and I refer to ourselves as classical liberals and not libertarians. Right. And we're fellow travelers without question, but I'm never going to be an anarchist. James brought me around on that point when we first met over a decade ago. I was a pretty staunch anarchist. And we recently finished a book. And in this book, at least in my mind, we started out as a tome of markets good, government bad. And it worked until the last chapter, and the thing wouldn't come together. And we're arguing it back and forth until finally the light goes off my head. No, this is not a story of government bad. It's a story of two tools, market and government, and they have to be used in the proper balance. Right. My book, All's Well, your people on the radio aren't going to see We'll put a link to it in the show notes. There's a guy reaching out his hand in kindness, but there's a sword behind him. And it's not just lying there, it's in a position exactly placed so that he can grab it. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most controversial things of my thesis is the proper use of force when there's some people who won't want to share, but they have a duty whether or not they want to. And where it really becomes difficult was when you talk about there's obstacles like sovereignty. For instance, when the young girl in Sudan is going to get her clitoris gashed off with a busted old tin can top, how do we fulfill our responsibility to protect her freedom? Both liberals and conservatives lay into us on a continual basis. But on the one point that libertarians lean into us is when we ask the question, what do we owe each other? Because we contend it is not zero. Now, I don't know what the right number is, but it is not zero. And if indeed we do owe each other, there is a place for government to use force to make that happen. I know it's not zero and I know it's not a hundred somewhere in the middle, right? And probably more towards zero than 100. But nonetheless, when we ask people that question, we ask them cold, we'll walk into a room in which we're speaking, we'll just ask them cold. Almost all of them come up with an answer between 20 and about 28%. That seems to be what everybody actually thinks we owe each other. Isn't that interesting? Well, to me, it's like, I think we owe everybody security and respect of the individual, access to food, clothing and shelter, access to the tools of self-improvement and to health, access to basic justice, access to basic finance, and access to a healthy environment. All of the things that we take absolutely for granted, and as not the way you guys talk about it in government anymore, but entitlements. Mm -hmm. We in our free white guy society think that we're entitled to all of those things. And if anybody tried to take any of them away from us, we would be pretty miffed about it. Here's the question though. If we are entitled to those things, what is there to distinguish us from the lady in Somalia? And it's going to have to be a cliffhanger because 
That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Be sure to join us next week when we try, and probably fail, to come up with something as interesting as this or even better. Until then, you know the drill. Follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join us on Words and Numbers Backstage, where the conversation continues. And for the love of God, be nice to each other. And not for nothing, but we're probably going to continue this discussion over on the Patreon account. So for the price of a cup of coffee, you can come and listen and hang out with us there. Hope you do. And until next week, take care of yourselves, everybody. You too, Ant. See you next week, James. <laughs>